Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you would use these moments in your word to help us to see the Lord Jesus Christ and to delight in him this Christmas. We give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what's the real cause for joy at Christmas? Why is the birth of the baby Jesus such good news? When the wise men hear about the birth of Messiah, the one who was born king of the Jews, they travel all the way from the east to Bethlehem and worship the baby. Why such costly gifts? Gold, frankincense, myrrh. And why worship? When the shepherds hear about the birth of Christ, they go to him in haste. They quickly find Joseph and Mary and they glorify and praise God. Why? Mary, after being told she would give birth to the Davidic king, what does, what does she do? Luke tells us that she praises God with great joy. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God. Why the jubilation? Why so much celebration? The wise men, the shepherds, Mary, Elizabeth and Zechariah, Simeon, The angels praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. Everybody involved is rejoicing and extolling God and celebrating and worshiping with great joy. Why? Why all the hubbub? Why such unvarnished delight? Is it simply because flashy things are happening? Angels are appearing. The glory of the Lord is shining. You might say, if I discovered that I was pregnant, that would get my attention. Or if angels appeared at my job site, then I'd be motivated. Well, maybe. Maybe not. But that's not what's going on here at the first Christmas. These aren't just reactions to mere supernatural events. These men and women are filled with joy and praising God because of the Christ child. They're thrilled that Jesus has been born. They've been waiting for him. They're all happy for the same reason. They're all praising God for the same thing. And now here we are celebrating the birth of this baby over 2,000 years later. Why? And if I can get personal... Why aren't you as excited as they are? Why aren't you marveling like Mary or wondering like the wise men or shouting like the shepherds or savoring Jesus like Simeon? What's your problem? You didn't come here thinking you had a problem, did you? Well, you do. You have a problem. And I'm going to tell you what it is in a few minutes. But first, consider John chapter 1 verse 14 with me. For a bit. We're going to focus on that one verse. You can find it in Lesson 5 if you want to look at the text. This is what it says And the Word became flesh. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's Christmas. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Well, who, who is this word? If you look back at John 1.1, 1, 1, at the top of the page, it says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. So the word was in the beginning with God. He's always been with God. And the word was God. He's always been God. The word is divine, and he always has been. He's the creator. Look at what verse 3 says. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So this word is none other than the pre-existent Son. He's distinct from the Father and the Spirit, and he's fully divine. He's God. And John 1.14 tells us that this pre-existent Son became a man. He became flesh and he dwelt among us. This is what the angel of the Lord was talking about when he said, That which is conceived in Mary is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. 
and you shall call his name Jesus. On that first Christmas, the eternal son chose to become like you. He entered humanity. He grew and learned as a man. He experienced fatigue and hunger. He was tempted in every respect, just as you are. This is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Word who became flesh. And the Word dwelt among us. God was now among his people. The Word dwelt among us. He, he pitched his tent among us. He tabernacled among us. In the Old Testament, God instructed Moses to erect a tent, a tabernacle, a place where sacrifices were to be made and, and priests were to carry out their duties before God. And through the institution of those rituals for cleansing and those ceremonies for worship, God then came and dwelt among his people. In Exodus 40, it says, The glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. God himself came and lived among the people of Israel. And that tabernacle was a type, a type meant to point you to Jesus Christ. He came. He was born. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And we've seen his glory, John 1.14 says. Glory of the only Son from the Father. Jesus is God in the flesh. And the disciples who walked and talked with him, they saw his glory. They watched him and knew him and followed him. They heard his authoritative teaching. They marveled at his power over creation and his power over sickness and his power over demons. They even beheld his power over darkness and death. They saw his glory. Glory of the only Son from the Father. This word was the Son sent by the Father. The Son came, Jesus came, ready and willing to do the will of his Father. He came on mission to do all that the Father asked him to do. And what was that mission? What was the mission that he came to accomplish? Well, he came to rescue lost sinners from their guilt and condemnation. Joseph was told to call the baby's name Jesus. Why? Because he would save his people from their sins, Matthew 121 says. And in order to save his people from their sins, he needed to become a man. He needed to take on flesh. See, you need a Savior. Each and every one of you, you need a Savior. Dear friend, you're a sinner. You've transgressed against God and you've broken his law. And that makes you guilty before him. Please understand that the wages of your sin is death. Because of your sin, you're alienated from God and separated from him. And hell is simply the permanent and eternal state of being forever separated from him. Hell is a place of everlasting hopelessness and loneliness because sinners will find themselves forever under God's wrath and under God's punishment for their sins. And without a Savior, you have no hope of being rescued from your sins. Now this can be challenging to hear, can't it? It can be hard to be reminded that you're guilty and deserving divine judgment. Merry Christmas, you're a sinner. This is where you encounter your biggest problem. I told you earlier that you have a problem. Can I tell you what it is? You focus too easily and too much on the people around you and on the things around you, and you focus too little, too infrequently on God himself. This is the universal problem for all sinners. I'm not looking down at my nose at you when I say this, because it's my problem too. So I'll start. Hi, I'm Eric. I'm a sinner. I don't love and worship God as I ought. It's true. All of us have fallen short of God's glory. So dear friends, you are spiritually nearsighted. Far away objects, namely God, appear blurry. You're myopic. Things near, the physical things of this world, other people, these are clear and they're crisp. But God, 
and his kingdom and the heavenly realities you were created to delight in and enjoy, they're fuzzy and they're unclear. So you need a savior and you need encouragement this Christmas to give attention to God himself. And this whole service today is designed to say to you, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. I won't sing a solo like Pastor Caleb and Pastor Mitch both did. But the hymn says, Hark, the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild. God and sinners reconciled. That's Christmas. That's what the angels were announcing. That's what the wise men and the shepherds were celebrating. That's why Mary and Simeon and the rest were rejoicing. Jesus came to reconcile God to man and man to God. He came to provide reconciliation between you and God. And how is this reconciliation accomplished? Jesus was born And he lived a perfect life as the sinless Son of God. He never neglected his Father's will. He honored him at every turn. He was law-keeping and obedient and God-honoring and God-centered in all that he did. He was tempted in every respect as you are, as a man, as a human being, yet without sin, without sin. And then he chose to go to the cross and die as if he were a sinner. He willingly became a sin offering by dying in the place of sinners. At the cross, Jesus was treated as a transgressor. He was punished as a guilty criminal. He was judged as if he had rebelled against God. Why? Because he was standing in the place of sinners like you and me. That's why. He was atoning for the sins of his people. He was punished for the sins of others. He was judged as a substitute for sinners like you. Jesus died to undo the curse of death. As an atoning sacrifice, he died to sin once for all. Then he was buried and three days later, he was raised from the dead. And this was all to show that God had conquered sin and death through him. And then Jesus ascended to heaven, and now, wonder of wonders, a man sits at God's right hand, the God-man. And when Jesus ascended, he was enthroned as king. He was crowned king of kings and lord of lords. And this he was able to do because he became flesh. He became a man. Imagine it. The divine son looking out over sinful humanity. And saying, yes, I'll go. I'll do it. I'll take the form of a servant and I'll be born in the likeness of men. And I'll humbly obey to the point of death. Even death on a cross. Imagine him saying that. Imagine the divine son saying that and then leaving the glories and the comforts of heaven to be hated and rejected and crucified so that you could be rescued from your sins, so that you could be delivered once and for all from your sins. Dear CMC, dear friends and and visitors with us tonight, let me encourage you on this Christmas Eve to lift your gaze above the things and the people of this world. Take time to look beyond both the hardships of this life and also the good things in this life and prioritize God himself, the one who knit you together in your mother's womb and created you in his image and designed you to know him and enjoy him forever and who sent his only son, his dear, dear son into this world to rescue you. Jesus was born. The word became flesh and I'm inviting you to behold his glory this Christmas. Mary could see it. The shepherds saw it. The wise men responded to it. Simeon beheld it. They all knew their need for salvation and they recognized that Jesus was God's provision for them. So they rejoiced and they celebrated and they worshiped God for the birth of their Savior. So I wonder, how are you responding tonight? 
How are you responding to the news of a Messiah born who can take away your sins? Tonight you can rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, a joy that's rock solid, a joy that's unshakable. This Christmas you can seek Christ and put all your faith in him and worship him as God with us. Perhaps for the first time you'll acknowledge your sin before God and turn to Christ by faith. Jesus stands ready to receive you, dear friend, if you receive him by faith, if you cry out to him to save you from your sins. Put all your hope and your trust in him, and you'll find great joy, eternal joy, the joy of sins forgiven, the joy of eternal life, the joy of knowing and delighting in Christ himself. When the Lord in his grace and kindness allows you to see your sin and confess your need for a savior, this honesty sets the table for the greatest joy. Because in Christ, God has been wonderfully merciful to sinners, hasn't he? It's when we see the depth of our sin against God and our our transgressions against his holiness that we then see the glory and wonder of what he's done through Jesus Christ to save us. Amen? The birth of Jesus Christ is reason for great joy. You have a Savior. God didn't spare His own Son, but gave Him up for you. He willingly sent the Son for your salvation. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Praise God. Let's delight in this wonderful Savior this Christmas. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank You for the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank You that You took mercy Upon us, and you sent a Savior who was able and willing to atone for our sins. And I pray for my friends here tonight, each and every one, that they'd put wholehearted faith, full affection, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and might devote themselves to Him and follow Him all their days. Thank you for the opportunity to gather tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.